All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Now, if you want to ask questions of my guests, it's very easy to go to the Patreon link in the description, click on that link, and you can be asking quest questions of the guests next. And also don't forget to subscribe. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, I always say we have a great guest, but today, this is an exciting one. Sometimes I feel like I could sleep through my interviews, but this one I'm really excited for. Monty Melnick is here. He was the Ramones tour manager for over 2,200 shows. Can't imagine how anyone could last so long in any job, but particularly in a job like that. He has a book on the road with the Ramones. The bonus edition is available right now, over 40 pages. I'm not kidding when I say this is my favorite book about the Ramones, and I have read every single one of them. So I recommend it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about uh, what he's up to now and more right after this. All right, let's welcome Monty Melnick. Monty A. Melnick. Yes, Monty A. Melnick. I, I somehow I forget the A. <laughs> By, the way, By the way, forty, 40 new pages, pages on the over on in the book. Not just you said forty pages. Yes, I <laughs> yes, yeah, so that would be a yeah forty additional pages, which <laughs> is what like makes almost four hundred pages or something. Like yeah. <laughs> forty pages, making it the bonus edition. The book yeah. came out. The new new uh, pages, yeah. Yeah, the book came out in uh, 2004, is that right? Yeah, somewhere around there, late 2003, 2004. I've had a couple of outdated editions. And every year, you know, over the years, uh, things happen with the Ramones, and they still happen. So uh, this last edition, I decided to put a bunch more stuff that was happening with the Ramones over the years. Yeah, and I can tell you that I couldn't get enough of your first book. I'm sincere when I say it's the best um, story of the, of the Ramones. And also because you let the people who were there tell the story. The book is quotes and stories from other people, and it's an easy read. I think some people open a book and, oh, my God, I don't got time for this. This is really an easy read. And if you are a fan and you want to know from somebody who was there what the stage uh, setup was like, what the, what the daily activity was like, um, unfortunately, you are the only person who is really alive to tell much of that uh, from the original lineup. Well, yeah, actually, I'm the only one alive today uh, that was there from the beginning of the Ramones to the end of the Ramones. It was Arturo and myself, but he's passed away, unfortunately. And a good thing about my book is you don't have to read it uh, or know how to read. It's good for the punk rock audiences. I'm sorry. No, uh, because it's full of pictures. They let me put in like over 300 images, pictures, posters, tour passes, itineraries. That's, you know, so it's, you can even just don't have to read it. Just look at the pictures, you know. Well, and also, you know, I think a lot of people have seen the documentaries and have heard the Ramon story by now. But these are things that you don't see in that. This is this is really for the fan. This is really items and things like from your personal collection and uh, things that you would not have known from just watching the movies or hearing the stories. What I try to do is get behind the band. You know, people go to a club, they see a band on stage. They don't realize there's a foundation underneath the band. There's the sound man, the monitor man, the drum roadie, the guitar roadie, the lighting guy. These are all important people. If they, if the sound guy's bad, the band's going to sound bad, you know? Or if mm -hmm. the, guard, the, the, the guitar roadie's not good, you know? <laughs> it's, it, though I, I try to talk about the foundation underneath the band. To yeah, also, and, what, and the bands, too. Yeah, and you do a great job of it. So I, as I was telling you, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what made me become such a Ramones fan. I hate when interviewers talk all about themselves, so I'll keep it brief, and I, and I thank you for indulging me. Uh, when I was a teenager growing up in New York City, my father had a sports memorabilia uh, store in the East Village, not too far from where uh, Johnny lived, and, and Joey, both of the guys. And uh, he was friends with a guy named Jerry Olinger, who had a movie material poster store on 14th Street, and Johnny used to go in there. My father told me, would you like an autograph from the Ramones? And I said, is this like a mariachi band? You know, <laughs> uh, which a lot of people probably were confused. And I said, okay. And he brought me these two signed photos, probably around Brain Drain era. And I just looked at this band and I was like, wow, this is cool. I got Ramones Mania, like a lot of people my age, and was blown away. And part of me couldn't tell if this was for real 
uh, I, and, and just was totally engrossed in this world of the Ramones. Fast forward ahead, I'm walking to my father's store and I run into Johnny in front of his building and uh, and, I, and I tell him that he's the reason why I bought a guitar, which a million people have told him. He spent the next hour and a half in the street talking to me about the Ramones and about being a fan. And so to meet your heroes, they say, be careful of meeting your heroes. I could not have had a better uh, experience. He was very kind. And over the years, when, I, when you guys would do things like in stores, because Johnny Ramone was a memorabilia collector, and, yes, and you yes. talk about in your book, he was very interested in helping me to get my collection signed. I have probably 75 Ramones signed items now finished uh, that Johnny a lot uh, helped me with. So I was really sort of this obsessed fan, but was really into it. And I'll tell you, there was a night at the Roseland Ballroom in New York City, and you guys were playing, and it was a, a cold night. And I, I had a big stack of records that I needed Joey to sign. And here I am, a fan, waiting at the door, and there comes Joey and you, and you guys are arguing and, and having a big bickering match. And uh, you go across the street to get the van. I go, oh, my God, Joe, Joey's standing here by himself, and he looks like he's in a bad mood. So I told him, I'm sorry if it's a bad time. He goes, oh, no, I was yelling at Monty, not you. It's fine. I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll well, Was this after the show? Before, sound check. Before. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so who, who, knows, who knows what it was. I think he didn't want to walk across the street to, to the van is, was my hunch. Um, Probably with the OCD, you didn't want to cross the street at that particular time, you know? Yeah, and we're going to get into that because I've had a career tour managing and I don't know how you did it. So we're going to, we're going to get into that too. <laughs> and then I got to know Didi. I worked for a movie company called Troma in New York and I wrote a part for him in one of these Troma TV specials just because he was my hero, why not? And I got to know him and every now and then he would tell me, he wanted to listen to Pleasant Dreams again on vinyl or something, and I'd get it for him, and he'd probably sell it, you know, whatever he was, whatever he was up to at the time. But I did get to know him, and years later, I moved to the West Coast, as most New Yorkers uh, seem to do, except for yourself. You stayed true uh, to, to New York. And uh, I went out West, and I would see Johnny, and we would talk a lot at these um, memorabilia conventions and things, and I would hear so many stories, and we could talk for hours about... Um, the Yankees, never about politics. And uh, yeah, and it was just uh, an incredible thing to be so close to people that meant um, so much to me. And that I saw Didi maybe three days before he passed uh, here in Las Vegas at his final show. And I remember telling Johnny about these experiences because uh, then I would see Marky and I would tell Marky, Look, this one says this. And, and I remember Didi telling me, I'm too old. I got this young girlfriend. I I, I can't keep up. I don't want to play again. And I, I was thinking this is a guy who might not be long for the world, unfortunately. One of his final paintings is right here oh, behind that's nice. me. Yeah, this that's one nice. was painted in 2002. So this is really... Oh, you got a good collector's item there. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a cool one. So you saw him in, in Vegas, but he, he, he passed away in Los Angeles, though. Yes. So he played yeah. the show at a place called Pinkies here in Las Vegas. And then he went back to Los Angeles, and I believe he did one... Uh, jam thing and and then he passed away yeah, it's weird because when he left the group i figured he would be the first one to be you know to pass away but he lasted a long time and he just had you know just had to have that last little thing later on and then unfortunately that that's what got him you know the only one that passed away the original ford from uh, the rock and roll life the other guys were cancers and it's so yeah it's so strange and so I write a, uh, before that, I remember Johnny telling me about Joey. He fell on some ice and he's in the hospital and, he, he, and, and then telling me that he was going to pass away ultimately. And I didn't know anything. There was no Ramones books. There was no Wikipedia. And I said, oh, are you going to go see him? And Johnny said, he didn't, you know, if he didn't want to see me in life, why would he want to see me in death? And boy, it's heartbreaking for a fan to not understand all of these things. So... Uh, that began my obsession with the Ramones. My theme song, uh, Richie Ramone played the drums on that song uh, that I had writ wrote. Oh. I just want to waste some time with you. And so I, it's, it's been great to be part of it. I've always wanted to have someone on um, who is Ramones related, but I'm always very particular about how you do it. And there's no one who has more history than you. So 2,200 shows, it's incredible. I, I got to ask you the first thing that I've been wondering. Was there ever a time you thought I'm going to get fired, and was the and probably often did you say <laughs> I'm quitting? I can't take it. 
Not often. A few times I got fed up. And uh, no, I, there's one time I got, uh, we were up in Switzerland, it was at a high altitude, and I drank a little too much and because of the altitude, and I was a little tipsy. And the, the band was worried that, you know, I was going to run away with the fee or something, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, no, you know, a few times I told them to, I told them off a few times, and uh, but you know I wouldn't have stuck around for all twenty something years if I didn't enjoy what I was doing, you know. And it's they funny. obviously respected what you did. Yeah, it's funny you talk about earlier about the the Ramones, the name because people initially in the beginning thought they were they were a, a, a Mexican band, Los Ramones or something like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the uh, Danny Fields. Danny Field, the original manager, uh, when they told him to go see the Ramones, he said, well, I'm going to see the cha-cha band or something like that. He didn't know what they were like because of the name, you know. That's a funny, funny little yeah, story. I, I, yeah, I think a lot of people um, uh, felt that way. So just rewinding a little bit, the history is in the book, and we want people to read the book On the Road with Ramones bonus edition with uh, over 40 new pages of material, and it's available on Amazon. Link is in the description. the one with the red Ramones. The red Ramones on it. Yes, and the yellow bonus edition. That's yeah, how we right, know. Right, yeah. we got the, the, the latest version. Um, but so a lot of this is in the book. I want to talk about some different things, but we should point out you were involved with the Ramones because you went to junior high school with Tommy Ramone and were friends for years, right? High Junior high school, high school. I was in bands with uh, Tommy before, well before the Ramones. I played bass, and uh, so I, I grew up with Tommy. I knew him for over 50 years. What's amazing also, so you talk about playing music yourself. You had two records out on Reprise Records, and you got to uh, support the Beach Boys, which are he heroes to the Ramones. Yeah, actually, like later on, uh, Marky did a, played a song with the Rockaway Beach with uh, one of the Beach Boys out on Long Island just a few years ago. Yeah, they like they like, they like the Beach Boys quite a bit. Yeah, I mean... Uh, it's the, you know, the funny thing about the Ramones is people think of punk rock, but there really was no punk rock before the Ramones and their influences, you know, Johnny's heroes are uh, American rock and roll, you know, Elvis and uh, the, you know, the Beach Boys and. Well, yeah, you know, when I was um, going over with Tommy, we were, uh, the Phil Maurice was happening here and that all, all, you know, great bands played there. We saw uh, the Who and Jimi Hendrix and uh, Sam and Dave and. It was a great venue there, you know. So we saw a lot of uh, great bands back then. They, they were all always into different types of music, not just one type of music. Yeah, it's it's definitely. I think when people dig into the to their influences, and then if you listen to the Ramones, you realize this is not just three chord punk rock music. <laughs> these melodies and and these things in the songs, harmonies and the things that go involved and. You know, I always tell people who are musicians, go try to play two hours of down picking all night. <laughs> uh, and drummers, too. Drummers think, oh, this is going to be easy. It, 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 and it never is. Well, that's what happened, with, uh, unfortunately, with Clem. You know, when Richie split, Gary Kerfess was managing the uh, Blondie. They weren't doing anything. And Clem, Clem, you know, Clem was always there from the beginning. And CBGBs, he was very good friends with them. And so Gary says, okay, you know, play with the Ramones. It's easy. Don't worry. It's easy. The problem is that we had shows right away. You know, we we he didn't have enough time to like integrate into the band. When Tommy left, Marky came in. Tommy worked with Marky quite a bit before he was you know played shows. Unfortunately, Clem didn't have enough time to integrate into the band, so it was right. He played two shows. Of course, he made a hell of a lot more money with Blondie, but uh, he was he tried and uh, th that was a problem that Kurt said don't worry it's easy yeah, the Ramones yeah. it's easy but it's not easy every little it's got to be tight 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 any little thing out of out of sync throws the whole uh, set off the whole all song off you know that's the problem you know did you have to tell Clem it's not working out yeah what happened nothing he understood he knew, he knew what was going on you know he knew he didn't have enough time to uh, really rehearse with the band and stuff like that. And of course, he, you know, Blondie was still back there, so it wasn't tr too traumatic for him. So, but the, you know, the, the band Johnny, Joey, and they didn't want to really tell him personally. So they told me to go to call him up and tell him, you know, you're not working out. And luckily, Marky was there to come right back in, so that worked out yeah. well, you know. But I mean, yeah. Clem, you know, he tried. He tried. He, he wanted to be remote. 
Yeah, El, he was Elvis Ramon for a yeah. day. Or two. Yeah, right. And well, we couldn't call him Clammy Ramon. That didn't sound good, you know. That's true, but Elvis <laughs> doesn't have the the e on the end. I don't. I don't, I don't know why they picked that. <laughs> Johnny probably did that because of his, his Elvis connection, you know. Yeah, I, I I I I would think so. So going back, Ramones are beginning. They're they're a three piece band early on. Joey's playing drums. Dee Dee's singing, trying to sing and play bass at the same time. And these are all basic players. And Johnny's playing guitar. And you went to see them at that point, right? You were working a little bit with them. Well, uh, Tom and I uh, developed the performance studios. We built the place, when, and we had we managed the place. We had our own uh, things going on. At, in the in the studio one of his my i was in another band at the time so i got a lot of free time in the studio and he one of his projects was the the ramones he put the ramones in just to produce them and manage them as a three-piece group but he you know saw what was happening with joey i mean with the with Dee, Dee not being able to sing so so that's what happened in the with performance studios basically yeah and so tommy assumes the role of drummer was he a drummer no, 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 no. Tommy was not a drummer. He's a guitar player. And all the groups I played with Tommy, I was a bass player. He was a guitar player, basically. Way back when, when actually in uh, Forest Hills High School, there was a group called Tangent Puppets, which, which Johnny was playing bass and t Tommy was on guitar. I saw them in, I think, 1967 or something. Wow. Or 66 in Forest Hills High School on a talent show. So Tommy was always a guitar player. The problem was when, they, when, when he pulled Joey off the drums – they started bringing drummers in. And drummers, at that time, the Ramones were so raw that nobody understood what was going on with them. It was hard to understand it, you know? So Tommy would sit down and say, you know, try to play like this, play like this. Eventually, they, they said, well, why don't you be the drummer? Because he developed that style for them. He wasn't a drummer, you know? As I said, when Marky came in, Tommy left. Tommy had to work with Marky for a little while to get the whole style that Tommy has developed with the Ramones, you know? It's, it's pretty amazing, you know, and it's a style that uh, uh, hundreds, thousands, millions of bands would then later uh, attempt. But uh, And Marky does credit Tommy for sort of showing him that style. It's maybe not being a drummer makes you come up with something that's completely original. Tommy was a great musician. He, he played a lot of different instruments. Never played drums before that. But after that, the, the Ramones, you know, he left. He was in a group called Uncle Monk, alternative punk country bluesgrass group and he played mandolin and fiddle and dobro and all that so he's a very great musician you know so you know doing developing the drums was very easy for him basically but he he did develop that style which is very unique yes and like you know that's why jam bands uh, i've managed several you're never going to play the ramones exactly right unless they're a real ramones fan he could be the greatest drummer in the world he's not going to know um the particular ramones style True. And so now you get the, the four together and you were helping out in any way possible You uh, at that point. Well, you know, um, they did, they had showcases there, which was nice. You know, they'd uh, put out flyers and invite people down and try to get managers and record companies and friends there. And at that time, they I was running a sound for them in the showcases. So uh, that's how I started off, basically. There and is then, no way... You know, you look at the old black and white videos where they fight in between songs. <laughs> there is no way you thought this is going to be my career. You know, twenty two hundred years uh, shows. Well, you know, I was coming from my band. I was coming from a band that had two albums on Reprise Warner Brothers, nineteen seventy one, seventy two. We toured. I was a very good bass player. All the people in my group were good, good musicians. So, seeing initially seeing the Ramones in the early years, they were so freaking raw. I didn't like them back then. <laughs> You could see the early shows, you know, uh, they have on, on the YouTube. It was a little bit painful, you know. So I, you know, but I said, you know, I'll work with them because uh, I was running sound and I did my best. And they started getting some jobs at CBGBs. They said, why don't you come over and do sound for us there? So I, just, you know, kind of moved on, you know, started yeah. working with them. Yeah, they got you better and better. They worked hard. I mean, it, it took a while. They didn't didn't happen overnight, you know. Yeah, well, well unfortunately, uh, the, the talent was growing, but unfortunately, some of that success wouldn't be uh, realized until maybe after some of the guys are even gone. It's it's a shame that that's how it's happening. Yeah, I mean, the four you know, original 
people in a group would pass away and then they really haven't seen how big they are now. I mean, the Ramones are huge now. Yeah. Unbelievable. And, the people say Stones, Beatles, Ramones in one sentence. That, that floors me, you know? Yeah. And you never would have yeah. thought that when you were at the rehearsal space. Oh, uh, no. Johnny always was looking for the next record to be the one. It's always going to be that this one is going to be the one. He, he unfortunately, he did see a lot of it. He did see the shirts everywhere. He did go out to Hollywood and sort of get the admiration. Uh, but it's th even after he passed, uh, it still grows. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, also Joey. Joey's always looking for the next record. That's why they kept, you know, after initially Tommy and Ed and they were producing, they started looking for the producers that probably could get them some hits on the radio, you know? Um, Phil Spector, John Beauvoir, Graham Goulman. They kept on picking people. Let's pick these guys. Maybe we'll get a hit, you know? Unfortunately, when the U.S. radio wouldn't play them. You know? No, I I think it took a long time for them to get it. Uh, that they were, but there were some really commercial radio hits that they were missing out on. Yes. Johnny, uh, w whenever I would mention or talk about anything about Phil Spector, end of the century, he would always say, "We never should have took those jackets off," um, because there's the one record <laughs> cover with the jackets on, and then there's the one record cover with the jackets off. And somewhere in his mind, he believes that that was the downfall. Never should have took those jackets off. That was a famous Mick Rock uh, photo. Yeah, who, who passed away recently. A legendary yeah. photo. Just four guys uh, on the cover, but really made, made a lot of history. And that record, going back, you know, some of the hardcore fans will say it's a little too polished, but there's great songs on there. Some of the real uh, Ramones classics. Actually, on that record, the end of the century, you know, people come to me and say, what's your favorite Ramones song? What's your favorite Ramones song? It's difficult. This guy, I like a lot of Ramon songs, but I do have a favorite Ramon song. It's on that album. Do you know which one I'm talking about? This is tough. I'm going to say maybe Danny says. No, no, that's about Danny Fields, his manager. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, it's see, all, the, all the way. All the way. Wow. Yeah. Do you, know, do you know why I like that song? It's it's got to have something to do with you. <laughs> yeah, hey, Joey wrote me into the song. Like mm -hmm. Monty's driving me crazy. It's like being in the Navy. So that's many right. Ramones songs. <laughs> yeah, that, that it's and it's funny on that record because so Danny Fields is mentioned, you're mentioned, and then on Chinese Rocks they change the lyric is Didi home to his already home, which I assume is supposed to be Arturo Vega, right? Yes, 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 yes. It's funny how many little inside uh, 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 gems are on that record. Uh, we're jumping all over the place, but I think that's okay, and I think that's part of the fun of the book as well. Um, it'd be hard for me not to mention right now, which I'm about Phil Spector, that after the Ramones, you worked, uh, you managed Ronnie Spector. Well, for, I, I, I worked with her for a few, I didn't manage her. She had okay. a manager. I did some road work for her. Beautiful person. What a sad thing that she just passed away. Yeah, just passed away. Uh, yeah, just passed away. Cancer. Yeah, and, and that must have been a great experience. And she had sang with Joey before. And, and Yeah, well, she loved Joey. I mean, this this clips of her talking about how she really liked Joey and loved Joey and Joey produced an L, uh, EP for her with Daniel Ray, and they got along very well. And she sang the Rainbow song that Joey wrote. And uh, they, she's a beautiful person, really. What a what a great voice, a talented person, very nice, pleasure to work for. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to make sure that we mentioned her because it's definitely a part of uh, Ramon's history and a part of your life history um, as well. So tour managing. You didn't know what tour managing was at that point in your life and what you had to do? No. Well, you know, as I said, I started off just doing some sound for them in a studio, you know. And then they came, went to CBGB's. I did some sound there. And all of a sudden, they started getting jobs outside, you know, around the tri-state area. They said, well, come on, do well, you know, come with us. And uh, so I was working in, in, in the early years doing everything with Mickey and myself and a couple of, you know. Uh, you know, schlepping the equipment, driving, you know, I work my way up. And that's how I learned the business, basically. You were all working up together as well. Yes, though, yes, yes, of course. On, yeah, you were, on the you were on the ground floor of something that a lot of people might not have believed it. And they worked hard. They rehearsed a lot. They really worked hard from seeing them from the beginning to what they developed later on after a few years. It was like amazing how hard they worked. Yeah, they had, a, and they, had a, they had an image. I mean, Tommy had it. He was the architect. Tommy has the he's the architect. I call him. You know, he knew what what to put together, the look and everything, and the songs. And so they they developed that over the years. You know, 
Yeah, and and and, and it definitely shows. Um, as a tour manager at the time, now I've tour managed bands that have pretty high strung personalities, different members of Rat, <laughs> different lineups, and uh, but it's different these days. We've got our cell phones with GPS, and if someone wants <laughs> to be on the guest list, you have a group thread. It's a totally different world. Oh, You're yeah. out there. You um, driving. Well, you know, in my day, uh, I went to AAA and got maps of each city and then Xeroxed them and then highlighted them and passed them out to the crew and the truck drivers, myself. Now, I didn't have a GPS back then. I had a, an Atlas and a AAA, you know. I call up the promoters or the book or the uh, club owners say, how do you get in there? You know, tell me, you know. So that's how I – now I wish I had all that. Uh, you know, initially later on I had a cell phone but not the GPS stuff, you know. Yeah, I could only imagine, you know, it's late at night and you got these guys in the van. And I I, I, I believe Johnny would sit up front with you, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and then what were the next rows? Well, then um, usually like Marky or Joey and then Dee Dee. Dee was way in the back because uh, he liked to smoke and sneak cigarettes out the back window. So we weren't we didn't like smoking in the van, you know. Mm. And CJ was back there, too. Right, so that was sort of so that. That's basically, you know, Johnny was up front. It's kind of like the the book cover here. Yeah, you did. Yeah. John, Johnny's up front there, and then and then, and then Joey and uh, Dee Dee and Marky and CJ and on the back. You know, it was a fifteen passenger van. So I had like four rows. Right. I mean, I, we did have port tour buses too. Yes, you, uh, for a little bit, not very yeah. often. Though. No, because we found that very expensive. They they didn't like to sleep on a tour bus. You know, a tour bus you got to sleep on it sometimes. They wanted hotels and a tour bus. We had a few tour buses. We tried it out. You know, in Europe we do um, coaches because we didn't have to sleep on the right. bus or anything because it was close to country to country there. So that I didn't do any driving over there. Uh, so uh, in the states we. After a few buses we had, there's a few pictures of the buses in my book there, they decided to do little uh, sections of the country. It's like they uh, go to um, California. They had someone drive the van there. We'd fly out there, meet the van and the crew out there. And then we drive up and down the coast for a couple of weeks. And then we come back and then, then do the, mid the Midwest for a couple of weeks and come back and the Northeast a couple of weeks and come back in, in the van. Did you, guys own, did you guys own the van? No, no we leased the van because we put so many miles on the damn things. We had to get, <laughs> after 80,000 miles, I, I'd go through the van, you know. The van should be in the Smithsonian. Some of these vans. Should well, be the yeah, if we had a lot of different ones over the years, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Chevys, Dodges. I like the, the Ford van the best, basically, the, the Econoline. Yeah, uh, but I picture late at night at a gas station, maybe a little lost, and then all these really uh, neurotic personalities, and then yourself trying to uh, to deal with it. I told you before we went on, Johnny once told me, because I would tell him, I saw Didi, and this is how he acted. And I saw Joey, and he would say, you see what I had to deal with? He reminded me of Mo from the Three Stooges. Huh. But he, he would say, uh, you know, because he was sort of the, the, the fearless leader, at least in his mind well, he was. Well, yeah, he was a general. He's like the general. Yeah. But he was saying, you see the personalities I had to deal with, and I'm thinking, you must have been feeling the same way. Not only that, I had, had to deal with a band, but a crazy crew, which doubled my nutty people around me. They don't realize that I had to deal with the band and the crew, you know? The, the band didn't have to deal with the crew unless they did a crappy job during the show or something like that. But, uh, yeah. Sage was, advice from Johnny. It's in your book, and, and he's told me as well, is stay on a separate floor from the crew. Uh, yes. Yeah, and you probably knew it every time you checked into a hotel. I say stay away from the band, too. <laughs> well, later on, Johnny didn't want to stay next to uh, – I made, made sure that Joey was a couple of doors down, not next to him. But, yeah, you know, the crew comes in late, and they, they – you know, they're raucous. They're drinking and whatever they're doing and making noise after the show. They come in late, and they leave early. It was disturbing. So we always put them on a different floor. Was there a lot of crew turnover over those years? Oh, yeah. Actually, look in my book. I list all the different crews. There's many of them there. Drum yeah. artists, guitar techs, lighting people. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. Well, you know, it was a rough job. And we weren't, we weren't paying a lot of money. That's the thing, you know. that the Ramones weren't making a huge amount of money. They, they weren't a super group or big group. 
where we could pay you know big salaries to keep people around. So we, we went through a, a bunch of people. Yeah, and uh, the money was in the T-shirts, not in the in the performances. Well, they were basically they were a touring band, and that's where they made the meat and potatoes. They realized from the beginning that the T-shirts and merchandise was where they're going to make some money. Yeah, and uh, and obviously, as we see, there's more T-shirts than record sales. Uh, you know, of Ramones, there's a T-shirt on every block at every mall. Everybody uh, has a Ramones. Man, I wish I got a piece of that action. Yeah, uh, what I can only imagine. Uh, well, what, uh, initially, uh, Toro, uh, the way the reason we can get him on the road in the in the early years was uh, he'd print some T-shirts up, sell T-shirts, and that would pay for his expenses. Initially, eventually, he got on the payroll. But that's the way he be, he uh, came out first in, uh, in the early years. So he'd print T-shirts and sell them, and that's how we got the we could afford to get him on the road. Yeah, and then and then he he was an amazing person with T-shirts. I hold. So a couple of chapters in my book about the T-shirts, how it, it it evolved over the years, and he really uh, he made those T-shirts in his loft, you know, silk screen yeah. them, put them up, hung, hung them up, and he had a big loft on Second Street, right around near CBGB's, and he had pipes there so he could hang all the T-shirts there and stuff like that. He worked very hard. His great, loft. Great person. Yeah, his loft was also right essentially across the street from the Albert Garden where that first. Uh, record cover was photographed. Yeah, right up the block there. Sure. Which is yeah. it's, it's it's if you're a Ramones fan, I suggest you make the pilgrimage to see that spot. It's very strange. There's a koi pond uh, where the photographer must have stood, and it's Roberta, like, it, Roberta Belli. Roberta Belli. Give her credit. Yes, absolutely. Uh, she took one of the most iconic photos uh, and record covers of all time. And uh, when you see you'll see the wall, it's a little bit different now. But I feel like for Ramones fans, if you want to go do your trip. You go to CBGB's, you go to the back of CBGB's where Road to Ruin, uh, uh, excuse me, Rock to Russia cover was taken. You go to the Arturo's Gallery. There's, there's a whole history for the, yeah. the, the Joey Ramone sign, Joey Ramone Place, is on right 2nd Street and Bowery. You've got to visit the sign first, and then right up the block is all that stuff there. you got to look up really high to see the sign because I believe people stole it so many times. Yeah, it was one of, the, one of the most stolen signs, yeah, yeah. I think that he would be uh, flattered, uh, to say the least. Oh, my God, yeah. And this is not, actually in front of Forest Hills High School, they put a sign, Ramon's Way, right in front of the high school. They named the street. How, how amazing. You, you should be doing the Ramon's tour. I've done, a, I've done a couple of tours like that. You know, people from Italy come in when they rent a van, and I give them a tour around. Because uh, Queen has a lot of, you know, where they grew up. I showed them all that. And there's a, the murals are there. they uh, there's a famous mural and a couple of murals of Ramones in, in Queens now, you know. It's, uh, again, these are things that were part of your life. You would never believe there'd become a time when people, uh, you know, want to tour to see this. And uh, it's it's that important. It just shows you um, how how the, the, the Ramones have sur survived and continue to survive. And I think it's one of the bands that people will be talking about um, forever. There'll never be a punk rock band that wasn't influenced by the Ramones directly or indirectly. Well, I have to say this joke. I told this a thousand times. I'm sure people heard this a lot. If the Ramones were this big now, and when I was working for them, I would, I would have gotten a big raise. Yeah. They're huge now. I wish they were so big back then. I would have said, give me a freaking raise, you know? <laughs> yes. So, so, Monty, we're talking about the personalities in that band and it's documented that they like to stop at the uh, convenience store after the show. And Johnny liked to have his Yoo-Hoo. And the, the most famous story, and, and you can tell it, it's been told a million times, but is about uh, somebody telling you about the nice boys that you're taking care of. Oh, <laughs> sorry. this is like my joke. I tell, I tell this a million times. Yeah, well, it was early years, so late 70s or somewhere we're driving in Texas, like rural Texas, you know, it was like, we're in the van for like hours, you know, and finally pull in for gas in a convenience store. So they get out, you know, they stagger around because they were in the van for like hours. They're staggering around. They looked, you know, the way they look with their leather jackets and their ripped jeans. They're looking around at the cookies and stuff, whatever. So I went to pay for the gas and the the, the uh, lady says to me, ah, oh, sure, nice of you taking care of those retarded boys. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, ma'am, that's my job. Yeah, she wasn't that far. She wasn't that far off. Uh, <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> different times, though. We did yeah. use different words now, but I mean, they looked uh, like at that time they looked like from another world coming out of the van. You know, 
Y yes. Oh, I can. I can only imagine. Um, so we know that Johnny was very uh, right wing in his politics. Some of the other guys were not. We know. We know that he enjoyed to listen to the Yankees on his transistor radio. Boy, Johnny would have loved uh, iPod, iPhone technology. I think. Oh, most likely. In, in the cover of the book, Johnny's wearing a, a, a Yankees T-shirt there. Oh, wow. If you look at the cup, you can't really see it now, but if you look at the cover of the book, he's wearing a Yankees T-shirt. Right. Uh, the great cover by John Holmes from was, you know, he, he uh, did the cover for me, luckily. It was a great, great idea. What You know, because when, initially when I was doing the book, I said, well, you know, a book has a cover, a, a picture of the band on it, but there was eight different Ramones over the years. So I figured, what's you know, what to do here? So I figured, let's do a cartoon. Who better to do a cartoon than John Holmes from Punk Magazine? And he, I was lucky enough to have him do the uh, the cover for me. Absolutely, John Holmes from also is the artist who um, uh, created Road to Ruin cover. Those, that's his artwork. Yeah, the, all the little the uh, images inside the rock. No, the Rocket to Russia, Road to Ruin. But he he worked on the cover. Yeah. That was somebody else's idea. He, he fixed that. But in Rocket to Russia, he did all the cartoons inside and the out the back cover and stuff like that. And we use a lot of those cartoons for T-shirts and passes and stuff like that. So we're, we're talking about the personalities. Uh, and Didi obviously had his issues with addiction. Was that through the, his entire career with the Ramones? Oh, yes, yes. Didi had so many different personalities, you know. He was a multiple personality, and oh yeah, he was you know he was heavily addicted, in and out of rehab, and he you know, OD'd a few times on the road, and it was a problem basically, you know. Yeah, and he, he, for for sure, and you know if you read if you read Didi's book, you know who knows what's true because Didi had so many personalities and so many different ways that he remembered things that who knows what he was telling. Well, yeah. The problem with Didi's book, he puts a lot of stories in there, makes up a lot of stories. Um, and the fact, after you know he left the band that he did, he had his book came out. He he had a little tour in in Europe or England. He said, "Why don't you come and work with me there?" I said, "Okay." I haven't read the book, you know. I went, got over there, and I finally read the book over there. And he has me like I'm drunk in the airplane, stumbling up the aisles, you know. And he comes, knocks on my door. And I'm, I come with like powder on my nose and I'm wearing a bunny tail on my underwear. He made up these stories. I, I said, Didi, would you? I just read the book. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'll buy you dinners from now on and stuff like that. Whew. He made up a lot of stuff in those books. Yes, and talking to him from day to day, you didn't know um, what you would get. So, uh, and then I believe Marky was, was uh, dealing with alcohol issues, right? Oh, yeah. Well, he got kicked out of the band, basically, because of his drinking, you know? So you have four extremely different personalities. It's also been documented a million times that Johnny's wife, Linda, had dated jo Joey earlier and that they had some serious issues uh, and, and not speaking for the most part, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't as bad as they make it out to be, but they, they didn't socialize. Basically, you know, they they realized that they didn't want to fight because the, what they were doing with their music was more important. You know, you go on stage, you get the feedback from the from the audience. The music was more important. Why, you know, have a fight? So they just didn't. They they, they talked. They had to talk about set lists and songs and playing in the studio and stuff like that. But uh, they just didn't socialize. Basically, you know. Yeah, they kept it together for the business. So. Now we're talking about you being in the, you know, with these characters. Do, uh, if you had to pick one, if, if let's say it's a day off and you're going to spend the day with one of them, which, uh, which one would it have been? Well, I got very close to Joey, basically, because initially one of my girlfriend's sister was Angela, who was Joey's girlfriend for a while. So I got very close to Joey and uh, and his family and... We, you know, I spent a lot of time Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving and hanging out with him and his mother, beautiful person, uh, Charlotte and Mickey and stuff like that. So, and he go, we I we go upstate to visit uh, Angela and stuff and different people. So I got very close to Joey. Also, I I had to work with Joey because of his problems. And you know, before he go on tour, I'd just come over and 
make sure he had the right stuff, you know, all his medicines and whatever he needed to take on tour. Otherwise, if he was out on the road, he'd say, I don't have this, I don't have that. I'd have to go, you know, it was hard on me. So I'd, you know, he'd work with him and get him prepared for the tour and stuff like that. And Johnny kind of saw that as like, um, a, you know, specially working with him special, you know, but he didn't realize. He you were giving, he, he, Johnny maybe thought you were giving Joey favoritism. Yes, 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 yes. That was, that's, that was person, a problem. That yeah, was a the problem. business person in Johnny should have realized how valuable that is, though, because Joey did need that special attention. Yeah, he didn't realize. I just thought it was like a, I was a kind of favorite favoritism there, but he realized that Joey had a lot of problems, and uh, I had to work with that. That was you rough. Talk, you talk about it in the book. I mean, there's times when you would get on a plane and fly somewhere, and Joey wants to go home and touch something um, because of his OCD that he missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was one one time we come uh, back from Europe, and um, I drive him back to his house, and he says, uh, "I got to go back to JFK. I got to do something." <laughs> okay, there's a taxi. Go goodbye. You know, I wasn't going to take him back. He took a gear back, touched something, came back. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So he really he if if you were not involved, he was still going to do it. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. 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 It, it's, it was uh, a, you know it's a compulsion. It's a very it's a hard thing. You know. In the, in the early years, we, nobody knew what was going on with him, you know, because it wasn't really diagnosed as OCD. So uh, it was rough. He said, you know, what are you doing? Why, are, you, are you crazy? Don't, you know, don't do that. But then later on, they, you know, it was a chemical imbalance, and he had some medicine for it. It helped a little bit, but he still had it pretty bad, you know. And it was rough to deal with, you know, getting him in and out of hotels and all the places in his house and all that, you know. When um, when you, when you would go back to your room at night, would you just say, "What the hell am I doing?" Or and Monty, let me ask you: Did you feel of yourself? Or do you feel like maybe you were a little bit of a neurotic character too? Now, who's normal? Good point. Are you? N no, <laughs> uh, but I feel no, like no. You know, uh, I had I, you had to work with it. You know, it's part of the job. So I, I developed a system to work with it and deal with it in my own my own little crazy way. You know. There's times I did, well, it got rough, you know, but uh, I was there for over 20 something years. So, and as I said, there was a loyalty to you with the band. And I think because who else could step in and do it at that point? You, like you said, you had a system, <clears throat> you understood the personalities. I'm not sure that anyone else would have been able to do that job. Oh, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, somebody would have done, done it, but uh, yeah, they, they kept me around because I, I did a good job and I worked with them. So it worked out. And you know, the, I liked the job because it was it was very interesting. You know, it wasn't just one thing. You know, you know, a lot of tour managers they go with, out with a band and then the tour's over. And then they got to look for another band. Luckily, they kept me on because there's a lot of stuff I was working with them for videos and right. of course with the movie and uh, rehearsals and stuff. So they kept me on the payroll. Yeah, you were right. You're not just the tour manager. You were everything they did. You were involved in. If it was a video shoot, you had to get them to the video shoot. You mentioned Rock and Roll High School. You're in the movie as well, which is a fun, uh, a fun little cameo. So yeah, it's not just the most tour managers have nothing to do uh, other than the tour. You were involved with this band's um, life completely. Yeah, that's why I stuck around so long. And of course, you know, they toured the world, so I got to see. You know, why not see the world? You know. You see the crazy footage of these fans attacking the cars, you know, over South America and things. You're there for all of these things. These, these yeah, that's what Johnny says. Oh, good job, Monty. Good job. Uh, <laughs> and then that from that Marky video. The mm -hmm. problem with that, now let me just tell you a story. So we didn't know how big they were there, you know. So we get, go over there. and uh, The f first couple of hotels, the kids were out there all night banging. We had got kicked out of several hotels because the kids were standing outside, breaking glass, banging on the windows and stuff so that particular that was an early hotel the garage came out to a one-way street like this we had to make a right i had four security guards with me there mm -hmm. so i sent them out they try to clear it away we pull out in the street and this car blocks our blocks us so we're stuck in the middle of one-way street and the kids are just a little over enthusiastic as, as you can see you know and it was a little it was a bit scary but uh you know john's saying good job monty good job well, I had four security guards. They couldn't, you know, it's 100, 200 kids out there, you know? You're also in a foreign country, and there's not so much you could do about the uh, 
the, the roads and the people, you know, it's a different yeah, we, thing. Yeah, we, you know, we have one way street and somebody blocked our way out of there. So, but it was pretty weird, you know, they, they got a good taste of what it's like to be a huge band, you know? Yeah. Right uh, absolutely. I mean, they see it and, you know, can only imagine what it would have been like, uh, you know, had they been able to kin continue. Although uh, after that final show, it didn't seem like it was long to happen. Uh, there was some talk about playing at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, this I heard from Johnny himself. I think it was very uh, brief talked about uh, what do you do? And I think maybe one of the, his ideas might have been to have Eddie Vedder. I think the other guys might not have been thrilled. So it, there was also the idea of maybe Dee Dee singing, although Johnny pointed out to me, because I always said you should do something when, and have Dee Dee sing. And, you know, Dee Dee comes up at the last show and he doesn't remember <laughs> any words and johnny told sure, me sure. that's your boy johnny goes there's your boy you saw how he did yeah you know initially johnny said uh well if joey's not there i'm not gonna really play with anybody and that's why green day came up and played all the ramon songs yeah for that and uh eddie Vedder looked pretty strange with a mohawk you know that was interesting well <laughs> And well, yes, there was never a Ramon who had a mohawk. And no, he's and the, like, the, that was like the English with the mohawks and stuff. I, I don't know where he got that, but that was very weird seeing him there like that. He seemed like a hot topic punk all of a sudden. It was, yeah. very, I, I think, the fans, although Johnny told me, he goes, you know, a few people flip him off. He goes, I'm okay with that. That's good. If I didn't like somebody, I would do the same thing. You know? <laughs> true, um, true. Yeah, he, they were definitely uh, uh, loyal to what they, what, what they did, but it wasn't. Um, it wasn't meant to be um, that final show was that final show, and everybody sort of went their separate way. No real goodbyes, right? No. No, John left right away, bing, bang, out of there, you know. Joey and, hung around a little bit, and uh, it was uh, not pleasant. What were you – did you have something lined up? What were you planning on doing next? No, really. I was just kind of like uh, recovering from – <laughs> I think I, you know, I, in the back of my mind, I think maybe they'll get back together again, you know. Right. But, uh, you know, after touring, touring and doing all those shows over the years, it was kind of like a breather there for a second, you know. You probably went through a little bit of withdrawals too, though. You know, waking up in your own bed every day is a strange thing. True. I think in, the, in my book, I said, uh, I'm a tour manager under withdrawal right now, you know. Yes, that's right. It's a, it's a great quote because I, unless someone's been on the road, they don't know that feeling. You know, you get home, I'm so glad to be home, and then a few days later, you're waiting to have breakfast in the lobby. By the way, i got to give a big shout-out to my co-writer, Frank Meyer, mm -hmm. who is a really great guy, and uh, he's in L.A. and with the Street Walking Cheetahs and the, uh, plays with a lot of bands out there. Initially, when I was approached to do a book, uh, I said, like, I'm not really a writer. You know, I don't write. Or and they said, oh, we'll get you a ghostwriter. So they came up with a bunch of different people, and Frank was one of them. And But he was, he did such a great job. He was a, he was a journalist and a, a huge Ramones fan and played in different bands. And we just hit it off well. So I gave him co-writing on the book, you know. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. And because you compiled so many quotes from people and you had to find quotes from, that you got new ones, you interviewed people. But yeah, you had a history. Yeah, oral history. You had to find some people who had passed. Then to put this into order and make it a, a fun read, because this book is a page turner, and I've never said that about something that I don't believe. I really do think this is the best Ramones book. I, like I said, I've read them all. But this is really, you can't get enough. And there's something for everyone, for the casual fan, but also for the hardcore fan like myself. I really enjoyed the uh, with the stage plots. I really yeah. love seeing the stage plots. Uh, how the monitors would be set up, that you had a bass cabinet on both sides of the stage, uh, you know, both sides of the drum riser. You don't see a lot of bands do that. And I, I really, there was a lot of detail in your stage plots. Yeah, that's why I try to put in all my uh, different things, the uh, riders, the dressing room rider, and the stage plots and all that. Uh, yeah, to give an idea what's behind the band, what, what, what goes on, where the, all the microphones are set up and stuff like that. If, if people are interested in that, uh, I put it in there. You know? And it's something that nobody else would be able to offer. You have this insight um, that you can share because a lot of these stories have been told. But these are things that haven't. And I also really enjoy... You know, Johnny played his style of guitar. And if they had a single that had a solo on it, he wasn't going to waste his time. And if you watch some of the live footage, you will hear a lead. 
And Johnny was obviously not playing that lead. I find it uh, really fun to watch. Well, you know, that for a couple of songs, very briefly, the guitar roadie was behind the amps playing some of those, that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he... And Johnny didn't, doesn't fake it. He doesn't act. You no, know, he plays the same chords, and oh, yeah. you'll hear that lead. And yeah, that's funny. That's weird that they, 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 they did that, you know. And, and uh, what do you think about his guitar selling for almost a million dollars there? It, it's amazing. And by the way, Monty, if we knew if, if we knew that what was going to happen, you could have bought that guitar or other guitars for a lot less money. One well, of the guitars he gave to Eddie Vedder at the end. Yeah, he sold that one to Daniel Ray, you know, and he put Daniel had that in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for a long time. And finally, the, the contract came up. He said, I'll take it out and sell it. And boom. Wow. And that's just the, the guitars of incredible price they got for that. And, and, you know, it was one that he used for a long time and a lot of albums. And so it was an iconic piece of uh, guitar there. Amazing. Amazing. He still had the receipt from Manny's music uh, up until he, you know, he passed. And I think he had Arturo sell some of that stuff on the website. If you would go back to Arturo's website, we could be millionaires with the stuff that these guys were selling. I don't think they realized how much it was going to fetch in the future. Well, luckily, I, you know, over the years got, you know, all these passes and itineraries. I stuck it in a room and, but, you know. I was close to throwing it out that close, but I figured wow. I'd stick it in Rome. But then they became bigger and bigger and over the years. And then I had like 15 auctions. Thank goodness. Kind of like my pension from the Ramones, you know? Yes, absolutely. You, you probably thinking about all the times you asked for a raise or whatever. Uh, at least you had this, uh, this gift that keeps on giving, which is that, that Ramones memorabilia. I look at, at my collection, which is an insane of things that Johnny had given me and, and, and some stuff Didi had given me. And I'm fortunate to have it as a, as a fan uh, because, you know, it, this stuff isn't cheap. Uh, it's, it's, it's not cheap. Well, if you ever want to do an auction, go to RR Auction. They're, they're great people. And uh, t mention my name. Say, uh, you, Monty sent you. And uh, you can get some that good money for the stuff you got probably, you know? Yeah. And sometimes you get to the point in your life when you realize I can't take this stuff with me. And uh, it's better to have the money and enjoy it. Well, you know, the thing with collectors, uh, it sits in a room. It's usually you can't see it all. My, my stuff was in boxes. I'm, I'm going to go open a box and look at something and put it back and look at something and put it back. Mm -hmm. So I figured, you know, I used to, I need the money, basically. So when this, some, some people are collectors. They won't part with anything, you know. Yeah, it's a tough thing. When this interview ends, this goes back into the closet. I mean, it's just out right now for the... Yeah. To be seen okay. one more time, and then it goes back into the uh, into the into the closet. Uh, <laughs> one of the other things that you know, I always wanted to have Walter Lore on the show, and sadly he passed. Mm, yeah. uh, he that, was a very nice guy. Great yeah, guy. very nice guy, and I got to meet him a few times and talk about it. We just never got it done. Uh, but he also played some guitar on some of those Ramones albums. Yeah, he's a good friend, and they, when when we needed some part here or there they bring him in and Ed Stasium did a bunch of stuff too and Daniel Ray did a few things here and there so uh, a lot of different people did participated they, they built, people don't realize it wasn't just Johnny's downstroking all the time you know yeah they and that's the other thing especially on some of those later records the sound is developing and they are they're looking for a hit and they're looking to have a, a some more to it Johnny did what he did but you had to have these other guys uh to do it, I you know. You also, you hear Didi talk a lot about uh, when he was alive, obviously, about his bass playing. Anybody could do it, and therefore he didn't really play on Brain Drain. Uh, and he says, you know, it's not a big deal. But if you're a bass player and you are, what Didi does is a little bit different. Uh, even his down picking and his selection and where he hits. Maybe it was a lot of it was accidental, but it became a sound. Well, yeah, and you know, as I said, they started early with hardly playing, knowing how to play instruments, and then practice, 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 and they developed up into the Ramon sound. So they it all developed over the years. Are you in contact with CJ or Marky these days? Or yeah. Richie? Yeah I, yeah, I just talked to CJ recently. He's doing good. Uh, he's out in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, he had, you know, he toured a lot with his different groups and stuff, and he did some stuff with the Gimme Gimme's, me first in the Gimme Gimme's. Yeah, he just toured with them. Marky's doing great. He's uh, doing some smoking word stuff in March, and uh, he has a, his radio station, a radio program on XM. 
Sirius XM radio. Uh, and Richie's uh, going to be out there again touring, and uh, he does. He's doing some comic cons and stuff like that. Yeah, it was. It's funny. He, you know, he was really the Ramon who was out of it, the limelight the most, and then finally came forward and probably realized there was some uh, some money to be made. Oh yeah, sure. You know, uh, and uh, initially, you know, when CJ left, they said, "Look, you know, CJ, you're CJ Ramon. You could. This is you could use this." He said, eh. "Took a while. He decided eh, that's it." Same with, the, with Richie. Richie didn't want anything to do with the Ramones for a long time. And then he realized he's Richie Ramone. And then uh, people want to hear that. Yeah. And, you know, he was a part of those bands. I, and a lot of people feel like those are the records that kind of brought the Ramones back for a little while. Um, they're un, I think they're underrated. Uh, there's some great songs on them. Yeah. Yeah. Richie was great. You know, he's songwriting and singing. And uh, when CJ came in, he kind of brought life back to the band he's a young guy and they kind of had to suck in their stomachs to keep up with him and stuff they he rejuvenated the band it was a pleasure work with him you know yeah absolutely i remember seeing those shows uh, when he first joined at the ritz you know in, in manhattan which was studio 54 uh, for those who don't know and that was sort of the beginning of the cj um run he still he was out of the marines with the short hair still yeah yeah and, uh, and 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 so it is great that the, the it's great that you're here to tell the history of it and that people are able to read this book because I do recommend it uh, on the road with Ramones. This is the bonus edition, so there's 40 extra pages. It's really easy to get. You go to the Amazon link in the description, yeah, and you worldwide. Pick, and, yeah, and I promise that you you if any level of Ramones fan, you will be uh, hooked on this book. And this is not just me saying it because you're here, because I've always told my friends who are Ramones fans. Because I think your book was kind of the the underrated one for a while. I think people, you know, oh well, you know, Johnny has a book, and uh, there's this official book. And I said, you really want to know the Ramones? Uh, this is the book that tells you the best stories, and it's from the person. Yeah, and it's from the person who was there. Yeah, my book came out before all the other books, basically, except for Jim Bestman's. Johnny liked my book a lot, and the way he uh, wrote did his book is kind of like like my book with the pictures and the you know it's not just text 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 pictures text so he kind of liked the way i got my book together yeah and he organized. passed before his book came out also yeah, right? yeah 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 so i think they also had to try to yeah you know piece it together as yes. Well. yes yeah um so monty what, what leads us to is what are you up to now i know you still work in production a little bit i'm up to about here <laughs> So I like to keep my nose above it so I can breathe. That's it, yeah. <laughs> well, good. you know, um, after the Ramones, I work with some, a couple of other people, uh, Ronnie Spector, Degeneration, Paul Winter, a couple of other people. Then I got a job over the New York Hall of Science as audiovisual supervisor. I was there for about 16 and a half years. And then I went over to these uh, Queens Theater in the Park, which is my last job, but that's with the theaters now and that particular theater in, in the Queens, they haven't reopened properly. So right. I'm kind of right. up in the air right now doing podcasts and things like that. <laughs> pushing, the, pushing the book. Yeah. This is a, uh, you know, I, I'm on Facebook, Monty A. Melnick and uh, Instagram, Monty A. Dot Melnick. And I put a little stories up there. I've been putting a lot of different stories. Your Instagram is great. The Instagram, um, it's like if you're a fan of the book and you even have the bonus edition, you still have gems that people haven't seen, photos and, and things. So I recommend people follow you on Instagram to kind Thank of you. see that. It's like an addendum to the book every day or how often you update. You really get a, a fun thing with yeah. a little story. Yeah, I try to put stuff up uh, daily. It's Monty A. Dot Melnick because somebody got my Monty Melnick. I don't know how they. I was wondering why the A became so prominent. Yeah. Well, I like I like to use that now as an author. Monty A. Melnick, that sounds good. True. You know? A. <laughs> an author definitely needs the the, the, um, uh, the initial. But uh, I, I can't thank you enough for for sharing your stories. I know you tell them a lot, and it's funny. I was looking at how many podcasts you did. I go, oh man, so, and some of these are like the Uncle Floyd show. You know, I mean, you never know what you're going to get, and you're <laughs> a good sport. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, I enjoy this. You're obviously, a, uh, uh, as we've said, you're obviously a patient man to be, uh, uh, you could be a mental patient man for what you've been through, but you're a patient oh. man because of the, uh, all the personalities. And to share the stories means so much to me. And I know it means a lot to Ramones fans all around the world. And so we're, we're so grateful that you continue this. People follow you online and get to find more and more 
things about the Ramones that they thought they would never know. Well, I just want to say to all the great Ramones fans out there, gaba gaba hey. Absolutely. I think that's the best. On the Road with Ramones bonus edition available now in the description. Thank you, Mont.